Uh, all. Uh, welcome to the Jenkins UI UX Hackfest. Uh, at this session, we will be recording uh, demos by Hackfest participants. Um, we have a number of uh, demos which have been submitted uh, for this session. So Felix will be talking about migrating Jenkins config layouts, and then we will talk about dark theme, about test environments and evaluation environments for uh, various topics. Uh, Wadik will talk about you new know, script security approval management UI, and then we will talk about documentation. So this is the current list. Uh, if any of participants want to suggest something, please uh, add it to the list, and we will add uh, that uh, uh, to the demo schedule today. So the session was scheduled for two hours, but yeah, I think that we will uh, be done in uh, 60, maybe 90 minutes. Let's see. Uh, first of all, before we begin, I would like to thank uh, all contributors. Uh, so it was a one week uh, long event and we've got uh, a big number of contributions to Jenkins UI, to documentation and to other areas. So far we have uh, 42 contributors who have submitted uh, their contributions to our tracking site. This is not a final number because uh, we uh, still have some stories on Jenkins is the way. Uh, so there are around 10 stories there. Also there are contributions which have uh, not been uh, reported yet. And if you haven't uh, reported uh, it, uh, please do it because we needed uh, to collect information uh, and we would rather want to know it sooner. But anyway, uh, uh, thanks to everyone uh, who has already participated. Um, we have uh, a number of major achievements during this Hackfest. So first of all, uh, redone the Jenkins configuration preview was released on Monday. And during Hackfest, we have done some testing and some uh, bug fixing. Then uh, there was a dark theme uh, proof of concept, which is now again available for validation and for testing. Uh, there were many UX improvements and uh, other components, for example, uh, info management skill and for credentials, script security, folder authorization, and many other uh, smaller or bigger patches in different components. Uh, also, documentation migration went pretty well. Uh, we've migrated around 40 documentation pages and uh, more than 20 plugins. So from what I've seen, and maybe Mark will have more detailed statistics later. And last but not least, we also had uh, eight knowledge transfer uh, sessions for contributors and for Jenkins users where they were able uh, to study modern practices and uh, to get more information about how to develop and improve Jenkins. So what's next for the Hackfest? Yes, today is uh, May 29th, but uh, the Hackfest is not over. Uh, so it will be open until midnight UTC minus 12. So basically anywhere on your earth. So if you participate in this session, you still have 18 hours or so if you want to contribute. Uh, then um, um, on Monday, we will also have a few sessions. Uh, there will be one session by Slavin Nunes about the uh, custom Jenkins distribution build service. Um, at, uh, and at 2 p.m. UTC on Monday, we will have results session where we'll talk about final statistics um, and uh, about our next steps with regards to SWATI distribution, feedback, etc., etc. And after that, we will we just handle and call the logistics, and uh, hopefully, we will be able to handle it as soon as possible. So that's the plan. Uh, are there any questions before we press it to the demos? I guess not. So if you have any questions uh, during the demos, uh, please ask Zoom Kuni or just chat. We will ask uh, participants about the questions or give you voice permission so you can ask questions on your own. And there is also a Gitter channel which we were using for the Hackfest. And again, you can use it in order to ask any questions. So that's it from me. And uh, the next presentation will be by Felix. Hi everybody, um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. So I cannot put my video for some reason, it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going, I want to talk about Jetagant, about a uh, int uh, rather interesting and important PR that's been on the works for over a year and with extra push for the last three months, which is uh, a PR that changed the form layout from using HTML tables to, to divs. This PR, and um, there are many changes and com 
this there is uh, there are big implications, mostly about um, a rework of GLE widgets, such as for a uh, formentry optional block, uh, descriptor list, many of them. So and I'm going to show show to show a bit how how they look, how the new forms look. So first of all, this is the PR, the PR number three eight nine five. We appreciate all testing possible. There's a there's a GitHub repo just for our, with instructions just to test this created by Olaf. Maybe Olaf you can put the link in chat. And yeah, and I and I encourage everybody to give it a give it a try. Give it a try. Look for complex plugin combinations, and if they fail, please report it. So first of all, I want to show how the management. Uh, form looks. This is the big uh, managed Jenkins form, the managed system, configure system. So the first thing you could you could notice is that the form is vertical, follows a vertical layout, no more side nesting. Now it follows a nice vertical layout uh, for every section and everything. Uh, they, we are working also to make them narrower so that because it's not really intended for them to be this wide. Yes, we want to optimize for readability and usability for the form. So this is, for example, the user configuration uh, part. Also follows a vertical layout. And here's some of the interesting stuff, which are the job configuration. Uh, this is a pipeline job configuration. You may notice that there is also some and we are we are indicating nest different nesting uh, uh, levels. For example, when they when one every somebody uses the optional block jelly widget, you will notice the content within is indicated by a yeah by this dash line that everything within it belongs to this parent code block. So yeah, um, this is how it looks with the Git plugin in the pipeline script from Software Control Management of Git. This is a really infamous one because it used to overflow and to leave the boundaries of this box, not anymore. And yeah, this, uh, and to show for the sake of completeness, this is what the configuration for a for a um, free state job looks like, would look like. Uh, Git plugin configuration, same as before, same widgets, uh, same nesting, uh, drag and drop widgets still work. Everything sort of works the same. So, but there are there may be bugs with certain plugins. We right now I think we only have one or two outstanding bugs, outstanding bugs in the whole Jenkins CI plugin ecosystem. There may be more, and we appreciate any reports and any contributions. Um, any questions? No questions in the chat. So, yeah, one question. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, the current delivery plan for this feature and uh, what uh, we could do to contribute to that? So, yeah, so basically it will just, the, the, the plan is for it to be merge into the, correct me if I'm wrong, but to merge it to the Jenkins master branch within the next two to three weeks maybe, as soon as possible. And uh, right now it's going straight into master. If there, if people find problems or people would rather opt out, we can create, we can try, uh, if somebody would like to commit time into creating an opt out option, it could be an idea, but it's going in. So any, it would be opt out in case somebody wants to put in the work, but it's, it's going in by default. I don't know if that's what you were asking. Yes. Thank you. So, and c can you give guidance for those of us who are plugin maintainers? It, you showed the poster child that I, I worry about and showed that it has some embarrassing awkwardness in it. I solemnly promise to release a new version that will fix many of those issues. But are there other guidance you want to give us as plugin maintainers to, hey, check this or check this? Is it yeah. look at your UI? 
basically yes there is one i have one example for you for example here you see this actually this is the docker hub notifications plugin entry so you see here this this uh, text box should be hidden until you select this when you click it shouldn't it should only expand not overpower everything and github uh, docker hub. So basically, the, and the, the reason for that uh, happening is that this plugin redefines GLE widgets. Basically, this uh, plugin redefines the entry of GLE, optional block of GLE, descriptive or list. So plugins should use default GLE widgets as much as possible and avoid redefining them, especially if hetero list is something that's most many times redefined that's a recipe for having a breaking form, basically. And if there, if any plugin author slash maintainer finds the Jenkins widget API to be too limiting, please be welcome to contribute the change instead of just forking it because it will go out, it, it will fail, it will conflict, basically. So, so my problem is I'm I'm not terribly skilled in Jelly. Can I ask on the Gitter UX SIG when I have Jelly questions? Is that the place to go for? Gee, I don't understand this or don't understand that. Where where should I go to find to get more education? Yeah, um, Jelly UX SIG. It's nice for it's a good way to for over uh, for general doubts. And if it's just more of a Jelly programming questions, I would welcome everybody to ask in the developer manual list. We are all monitoring that list anyway for Great. for Jelly, but more, that's, I think that's a resource for more developer oriented, I, I believe. But yeah, we, we, we are all also paying uh, daily attention to the UX, so Thank any you. resource would do. Okay. Thank you. So we got one question in the chat. Is uh, this feature makes a lot of sense for mobile devices? Do we also plan to change the menu to be more mobile friendly? It's a step by step. So right now we're working on the forms. Probably the tables should be next when made to make it responsible, uh, responsive. So basic, um, we're getting friendlier. We will not get there in. 100% mobile work in one single PR, but this is a step towards it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions to Felix? So, no questions. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, to you, to Josh, to Tim, and to all other contributors who work on this feature, uh, because it's a really big improvement, uh, and not only for mobile devices, but also for narrow screens. So basically everything which is smaller than 1,000 pixels. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have another question. Yeah, I have another question. Um, so for our testers testing this feature, is there any um, special things that you would like or know that we should pay special attention to? Yes, if somebody knows of a plugin that, that has complex UI form stuff like checking a box, selects another box, um, checking a, selecting an option, populates a select box in another part of the mm -hmm. form. If you know about some of these, please test those specific ones. <laughs> All right, makes sense, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, about such type of plugins, uh, does this change currently apply to um, uh, build parameter forms? So when you trigger a build, uh, you can also uh, specify parameters. And there are many plugins there which have uh, quite uh, extensive and opinionated uh, layouts. Yeah, I mean, uh, the build parameters uh, are supported. Mm -hmm. um, if each plugin, uh, I mean, the lay as soon as the layout for each the, for the view for each plugin works, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be any problem. Okay. Thank we, you. Yeah. So just to recap, 
a plugin that's not adapted to the Git parameter plugin, and it works fine, for example. Yeah, I rather wonder about advanced plugins like Active Choice, uh, etc. But yeah, I guess we will figure it out uh, during the next phases of testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot for your demo. If there is no other questions, we can uh, continue. Okay. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. So the next presentation is by team, and uh, this is dark theme for Jenkins. Oh. All right, I'll just share my screen. It's not really much to talk through other than show um, what we've got to. Um, you are going uh, to have a dark background for this presentation. No. I, I, I would have if I prepared in time, but my computer decided it is not going to work immediately restart. Um, can you see my Jenkins? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so one of the areas where we've got quite a lot of feedback on in the UX areas for Jenkins to improve um, was that there was a lot of interest in a dark theme. Um, so we had a bit of a look around to see what dark themes already existed. Um, and there have been a couple over the years, but none of them were maintained anymore. And when I tried to run them, um, they didn't work in quite a few areas, especially with the new UX reworks, but even some changes from a couple of years ago on the new job screen completely didn't work at all. Um, so decided to take some inspiration from the Camelot dark theme um, for the colors and the styling contrasting, um, but all the code was created as part of this. So what we've managed to come out with is a pretty much a completely functional dark theme. There's a few issues um, and a few plugins that need some tweaks or different images, but in general, it works fine. We've tried to make it just a so less invasive than some of the other themes in Jenkins, like Material and Neo. This is using all of the Jenkins built-in um, images. It's all it's changing is colors basically. Um, so it should be it should be quite maintainable. And uh, we've also done a big rework into the Jenkins core to use CSS variables instead of um, overriding selectors all over the place, which again should be more maintainable um, as we don't need to worry about the CSS markup as long as the CSS variables stay in place. And if they do change, then it should be quite a minor change. So that's a short introduction. Um, let me just take you through a few different screens just so you can see what it looks like. So what you've got, what you can see at the moment is just the Jenkins homepage. There's about a dozen jobs that are created to, to showcase um, what it looks like for different sorts of jobs and just build the table up a little larger. Um, you can see that the build queue widget is there. It's got the different nodes. Uh, so the build executor and then the build queue. You've got the pop-out um, window here. It's all working fine. And the context menu here. Should be doing something. Uh, you've got the breadcrumbs there. You've got the search bar here. And you can click through and go through to a job. Um, so the pipeline stage view plugin needs a bit of work. I'm actually just going to go back and pick one that has a few runs. So pipeline, it's got a few different stages um, and some runs. So you can see here, this doesn't look the best, um, but that's so that's all contributed by a public uh, plugin. So it's likely a bit more work. Um, and you see here, all of these icons here and the sidebar work fine. There's one icon where we're aware of in the pipe, one of the pipeline plugins that is using a GIF rather than a PNG. So it doesn't have transparency. Um, so that needs to be fixed in the plugin to use a PNG instead. But that's, I think that's the only issue we've seen. In the, well, I think it's one of two issues we've done related to icons. So it's, it's been surprisingly good. Um, uh, another menu here. Um, I'm going to create a job next. You see, you see the create job experience. Um, and views work, of course, as well. Um, so I 
create a job is going to be pipeline four. It's going to be a pipeline, and I'm going to copy it from pipeline. And you see here we've got, and so it's automatically pulled in the pipeline from the previous one. Uh, I can parameterize it and add a string parameter. Um, a plan fault and trim. Um, so there's another issue here, which is another pipeline control in the plugin. Um, so that needs a fix. Um, and then if I go build with parameters here, you'll see this is what the full input looks like. And you can see that, it, that you can use this. Um, and then if I go to, if you want to go to manage Jenkins, so go to so this, that was a user focused view of it. Now if we just go to what an admin would see, so manage Jenkins, all the tiles here show up appropriately. And if I go to manage plugins, the plugin center shows up and some contrast here uh, for the categories. That's all normal. I don't think there's anything special here, but just to show you that you can um, almost there, flat. Um, and then going back here to configure systems, the main system configuration page, which is a little bit slow, but we're getting there. Very slow. Um, so you can do system research and then preview it. Um, and then this is just going through the system configuration page and there's nothing really jumping out. Um, possibly the info message is a little bright. Um, but it's all functional. So that's pretty much the demo of the running Jenkins. Um, just to show you where it is and I'm sure the recent links that you can find. Um, so there's a GitHub repository in the Jenkins CI GitHub organization called Dark Theme. Um, it's here at theme.css. Um, there's instructions on the GitHub page and a couple of screenshots. Um, see the plugin documentation. What's the demo? Uh, there is a video link for the oh this one yeah um so oleg has put together a demo folder um with instructions on how you can run this as well um you can i think there's a published docker image and you can also just run make run inside the demo folder if you want to try it out where it's currently using a pull request on the jenkins core um for the css variables change um i think look it's looking quite close to merge though so very soon you won't have to do that. Um, and then this will be available for use and we'll release a 001 version. Um, so, so there's a pull request here, which introduces the variables. It's had a few reviews already. Um, and so hopefully, so possibly by the next Jenkins version next week, we'll be able to um, release the initial version of dark theme for anyone to use. Um, in the meantime, you can test it by building a custom version or using the Docker image um, and just test it and give us feedback. Um, the best way to do that is to create an issue on the um, GitHub repository. And so we've got a number of issues already open and we've got a number of issues closed as well. Um, so please give it a go and give us any feedback. And thanks for anyone that's done any testing already. It's been really useful. Okay. Thank you, team. We've got a number of questions in the chat. So the first one uh, is, you mentioned that uh, we did some changes in the core. 
Yes, so there are any impact for existing themes uh, that were created for the simple theme plugin? No, so it's completely compatible because the changes in the core are just around adding variables and some very minor consistency changes. It's found that some colors were slightly different in certain places um, and, and some weren't using variables when, when the variables already existed. Um, so there's no, there's no real styling changes part of it. Um, and we have, we have tested the, I think the Neo theme was tested by Oleg just in case, just to see if it was. Um, and we've added, so there is one caveat with this that it doesn't, so the dark theme is not going to work on IE11 because of the features that we're using. Um, and we've done some testing just to make sure that IE11 didn't break because we had to add some pullbacks. Um, but we intend to just maintain compatibility for now, but no dark theme support for, for IE11. Right. It's also worth mentioning that even if uh, this particular uh, change doesn't break themes, we will break themes soon because there are other changes coming down the line. For example, um, uh, the story uh, Felix was presenting about uh, migrating from uh, tabs, uh, tables to divs and maybe other stories. So recently we have published a policy for UI themes support and we explicitly say that we don't guarantee compatibility. So for Neo 2, yeah, I think we will be doing a best effort to keep it uh, uh, up to date. And I believe the same for dark theme, but uh, in principle, we don't guarantee compatibility. Yeah, uh, there's another question. Um, how easy would it be for users to make a dark variant of their existing theme? Um, so once this core progress is merged, then a theme maintainer could migrate over to using the variables rather than having to override all the styling. So there'd be a bit of rework for them in their theme and also be a reduced set of Jenkins versions that are available. So basically you need to use the bleeding edge version of Jenkins to be able to use this. Um, but you can still, they, they could definitely duplicate. So they have their existing selectors and then duplicate it with the variables as well and that would work together. Um, so it should be quite straightforward. Um, if you, I haven't shown the code in this, but the dark theme code is about 50 lines of variables plus a Eight. theme over 18 uh, hours. <laughs> um, plus we've got, we've overridden the theme for the um, script console as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and now two team uh, is more than 400 lines in total. Uh, yeah, and yeah, plus there are other images, SVG, SVGs, uh, various hacks which allow to overwrite images, etc. Uh, it definitely looks great, but uh, it might be difficult uh, to maintain it uh, when we start uh, doing uh, all the changes in the UI. So I would anticipate that uh, Neo 2 team theme and other themes will also update to CSS variables soon. Yeah, so yeah, I'm very keen to keep this theme minimal and using core as much as possible. Um, so it doesn't have to worry about breaking as much. Okay. Are there any other questions? Looks like not. So then uh, the next presentation uh, is by me and I will be uh, talking about test environments. Am I still online? Yes, you are. I can yeah, wait because and... yeah, Tim's uh, screen froze for me, so I wasn't sure what's happening. Okay. So I'll share my screen. And yeah, we, oh, do you see my screen? I see about yeah. three, 300 icons. <laughs> yeah, if you're a Windows uh, user, that's how you use your uh, desktop because I rarely, really visit it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm guilty of that, sorry. Uh, it wasn't the case when I was using MacOS. Okay, let's go to the actual demo. So we had two presentations already. One is about uh, tables to the migration, another one by Timo about duck theme. And uh, both of these areas have one common problem. If you, uh, as a user, want to relate to that, you need an instance uh, which you want uh, uh, to set up and uh, you need to set up plugins, you need to configure the instance just to relate this component. And uh, for example, during hard test, it was uh, difficult for those who wanted to do UX testing uh, for these components. 
And as a part of the hug test, I created a few demo environments in order to um, support uh, various use cases. So uh, if you have seen previous Jenkins online meetups, a couple of years ago, I was presenting my demo for Jenkins configuration as code. Um, it's a fully, uh, it's a repository for demonstrating configuration as code and for developing uh, uh, pipelines for CI Jenkins IO. Um, this repository is fully configured by configuration as code, mostly by Groovy hooks at the moment, uh, but I'm uh, going, moving to JCASC. Um, and uh, this repository includes a number of uh, pre-configured items, for example, jobs, users, agents, um, and uh, also plugins. It uh, includes more than 100 plugins, and some of them are pre-configured. So I decided that what if I uh, updated this demo and made it possible to uh, easily test the dark theme or table studios migrations for users? And yeah, first thing I've done, I just updated this demo. So you can see that uh, this. I, this demo has been just released uh, a few days uh, ago, and this demo now includes support for system read and manage permissions. So this is what was uh, released on Monday uh, in uh, Jenkins Weekly. Then yeah, there was a lot of updates, but basically it includes all the recent versions of plugins with uh, configurations and also the support for additional users. So for example, for this demo, you can uh, easily test uh, uh, a common admin user, uh, users with managed permissions, users with system reads, or just common users, and uh, all configurations are included. Um, and in order to run this demo, you basically just need to, to enter make run in this repository. It will build everything and run that. So I won't be presenting this uh, repository because I actually have a demo specifically, let's say, for the dark theme. So. Um, I kept extending this demo, and if you go to the demo folder, you can see that this demo is actually based on my uh, demo Jenkins config as code. So it just takes uh, this demo, it uh, overrides the Jenkins war file because we need uh, one uh, from the snapshot, so which is not released. After that, we install additional plugins. Actually, it's just a simple theme plugin. And uh, um, uh, then you, uh, you install additional scripts. So why there is so much additional steps is because we want to support multiple modes. So for example, you uh, may want to just uh, run this demo or you may want uh, to run it, uh, for example, in developer mode so you can uh, could develop a theme or you may want to run it with preview user interface. In Jenkins Core now we have not only a standard UI but also preview UI with some experimental features which you could try out and we also support that. So there is, for example, um, uh, some uh, scripting project which uh, sets additional flags if you want to run development mode or use experimental UI. And after that, uh, there is a groovy hook which basically uh, configures theme, etc., based on the main image. So, as a user, if I want to test the dark theme, I will just need to run a one command make run. And after that, uh, you basically will get uh, the same interface like theme presented, uh, but with more plugins, etc. I will launch this demo. It will take uh, one to two minutes to start up. It really depends on your operating memory. So in my case, I don't have much one. Uh, so it will take some time. Um, what this demo does is basically starts a Jenkins instance. Uh, then it installs uh, plugins which are bundled in the image. Uh, then it uh, invokes Jenkins configuration as code, uh, configures some bits of the instance. And then it invokes uh, system groovy scripts and configures the rest because my image has a lot of dynamic logic which you cannot currently configure in JCASC. Well, you can, but by, doing, uh, by adding groovy expressions as well. So let's wait for a while. I'm not sure how long, but it shouldn't take that long from this screen. Yeah, you can see that uh, there was JCASC already. It's quite quick. Then we have uh, Groovy hooks, which also initialize our instance. For example, create users, configure particular plugins, uh, initialize demos, set in pipeline libraries, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So everything uh, is built in. And after that, yeah, it requires some time. Production folder, we configure. 
uh, more plugins, more tools. Ah, yeah, and then we enable team. So Jenkins is fully up and running. We can go to our host. And here we get uh, to the instance. Again, uh, it is a uh, dark team, but yeah, currently a login team is managed separately, so it's still yet to be done. And here uh, I will. Uh, just a question, Oleg. Did you mute yourself? Yeah, your sound cut out for me, Oleg, about 20 seconds ago. So, okay, you're back. Yeah, working again. Perfect. Sorry, we, we, we missed about 30 seconds of your dialogue, Oleg. Oh, sorry. Stop, stopped on the login screen. Okay, so basically what I did, I just logged in as uh, read-only user. So to show you read-only Jenkins configuration with the same demo. And yeah, let's uh, um, go here. So you see dark theme. You can see that I have much less controls. And apparently I misconfigured my instance, so it doesn't show all the jobs here. Or maybe there is a glitch because it wasn't showing them and now it shows them. Uh, I don't know. That's definitely a topic for testing. But what's interesting here is, for example, managing things. So, for example, if I want to test system, uh, read only system configuration, uh, this is how I would do that. I can, for example, go to the plugin page. I can verify that uh, I have access to this plugin page, but basically I cannot modify anything. Um, then I can go to system configuration, and again, I shouldn't be able to uh, modify uh, anything as well, even if it ever opens. Oh, like the, the scripts that you've got that are doing all this are right inside that repository. They're just groovy scripts that you've got that are that are doing the between configuration as yeah. code and yeah if you go here to my repository so you can go to any scripts and you can see that uh, there is some magic inside uh, but yeah basically the main initialization is here so for example if i want to initialize my development folder for pipeline development you can see yeah the script here so basically it checks uh, whether uh, there is already a development folder, if not, it creates that. And then it checks whether there is a local pipeline library development environment and if yes, it just initializes jobs and demos in this folder so that I can uh, test it without really committing anything. Uh, so yeah, there is some magic I was presenting at previous meetups. I won't be going deep inside. Some of these demos can be actually replaced by configuration as code at the moment, uh, not all of that. So for example, uh, here's one uh, example, here's another example for Docker. Again, you could configure it with configuration as code YAML, but uh, Jcask doesn't support uh, templating now. And here I basically do templating uh, using Groovy features. So I create a template for Docker image, and then I just have to write uh, this uh, template for common agent and for Maven agent, which sets additional options. So, I think JKS does support that in the latest version to a degree with, with um, anchors. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, technically you can do template anchors anchors. Uh, nice. Thank you. Thanks for showing it. Sorry to derail yeah. your demo. You, you can go back yeah. to your demo. I just, I, I, you, you give me hope when I see things like that. Oh, there's even more I can automate. Thank you. Yeah, right. So if you want to, uh, to try out uh, a demo which configures a lot of things, so for example, at some point we created a demo for uh, Cloud Biz Jenkins distribution and JCask. So yeah, it's a Cloud Biz Jenkins distribution, but basically it includes uh, the same open source plugins. So here, for example, you can find a long YAML which configures a lot of plugins. And there are more demos like that, uh, for example, in uh, configuration as code repository. So you can uh, find uh, more examples if you're interested for uh, JCask. My demo is just a bit old style. Thank you. Yeah, here are all the demos for JCask. 
Okay, so let's go back what I was showing. Yeah, I was showing uh, admin configuration. So yeah, you can see that uh, it works well mostly. So for example, uh, these con components are read only, these components are read only, but we still can modify them. So there is still some improvements to be done for system read permission, but generally it works pretty well even now. And yeah, that's why we have several months before the next uh, LCS baseline. So yeah, you can try it out with this demo. And for example, if you wanted uh, to, if you want to try um, the UI Felix was presenting, I also deployed a demo like that. So basically it's exactly the same. I just copied uh, the demo from the dark theme, uh, spent 15 minutes to update the dependencies. And now there is a demo also for um, uh, tabs uh, to this configuration migration. So this demo is basically the same. It just uses another baseline. At a, it enables additional permissions. Uh, so for example, you can run it this common thing, this run preview, and you can get interfaces Felix was showing, but also this pre-configured set of plugins and jobs. So uh, it's good for evaluation, and actually uh, these demos can be just run uh, by uh, make run, and uh, this make run, if you're interested, is just, uh, well, it's something like that. So basically it runs the image and everything is packed inside. So if you want to try out uh, the new features, you can uh, take one of these images and uh, get them running. You don't uh, even need to build them because they are deployed to Docker Hub. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so Again, we will appreciate uh, all kinds of testing for these new features because yeah, there is a lot of changes happening right now uh, and yeah, we will definitely benefit from some uh, additional testing for them. So for example, this is manager permissions, which is also in preview and you can also test it uh, from this demo and it just doesn't uh, provide for the entire config. I tested it, it works. But definitely we can keep improving all these configurations and we will appreciate your feedback. Okay, that's it from me. If there is no questions, we can move on. Okay, so the next presentation will be by Vadek. Yep. So, if you see my screen, that's good. Yeah, nice fish. Yeah, so we are like for the Vardek. clean desktop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you were cleaning it during my entire presentation. It was just removing two icons, but yeah. So, this demonstration is especially about how to manage the script approval. So, for people that are not aware of, you have normally some script, some job inside your instance, and sometimes you have some pipeline script. If you are not using the CSM, so the Git integration directly, or other CSM, of course, you have multiple version, multiple possibility to insert your own script. In that case, it's just inline pipeline. You have also the possibility to retrieve them directly from Git. In this case, if you are doing the, the, the configuration with the inline pipeline, you have the possibility to either retrieve the information, write the pipeline directly there with approval from an admin or using Groovy Sandbox. With the Sandbox, you are requesting approval for different signature. In my case, if I'm using the Sandbox, this call to the method println is something that needs to be approved by a, an administrator. If you are not using the Sandbox, it's just the full script that is approved or not. So what is the problem with the current version? So if you're going to the in-process script approval management link, so inside the Manage Jenkins page, you will see the number of things that need to be approved and you get to something like this. So a full page of things that you need to approve, deny and things like that. You have the full script, you have the possibility to approve or deny the different things and you have some signature that are already approved, the things that you need to approve and the possibility to clear the previous approval. So that's the previous, the current version, if you want. And here you have the new version that I was working on and you will see 
the PR directly there. So the new feature that I'm proposing with that PR is that you can see all the pending approval inside the table so that you can expand the code or minimize it. So you are not um, put in a page with a lot of noise if you're only wanting to approve one script in particular. For example, in the previous page, you have some script that are not very long, but still um, taking half of the screen in terms of space. So it's not something that you really want in terms of UX. In this case, you just have the number of things that need to be approved. What are also added in terms of a feature is just the size of the script, nothing's really fancy there, but also the request date. So to know better what is recently requested or not could be helpful for the admin to determine the order of approval if you want. In addition to that, you can now select multiple things and approve or deny directly in mass editing. So that's something that will normally give you some time because doing it manually in this page could be a bit more annoying potentially it's not really a big deal it's just a nice to have feature that we are in there that's one of the page but it's not really the most important part the important part of that pr is for the script that are already approved so in that list, you have the possibility to see the previous approved script. In the previous version, when you approve a script, it's just the information you have. It's just all previous script approval and you have only one possibility to clear the approval, nothing else. You are potentially a Jenkins expert and you know that these scripts are just stored in the file system. So if you want, you can just remove the different hash that are stored and it's good. You can manually and individually remove script. But as you know, you only have a hash and in case of a hash, you don't know what is the script behind. So it's just like playing a game, trying to remove things and oh, it's breaking my instance or not. With the new approach, you have no metadata by default because we still have just a hash. We cannot uh, find magically the information behind that hash. But in the case that hash is used by someone with the approval, so it will not block anything. But if you are using that information, for example, that system uh, command to run the agent that you are seeing there, you can see the command because the hash is computed from the, uh, the script. And so with that information, we can collect, gather some metadata. In this case, I know that it's that command that is linked with that hash. And so I can show you the information. If you want to know what is the content of that hash, it just expand the code, you see the, the content. You know also who was the requester in case we have that information, especially if it's something that was approved after the metadata introduction. You can see the approver when it was approved the last time. Also concerning the usage, if you are using that script, that code very often, you will see a number of usage that is very high. And in contrary, if you are never using a script, for example, or this one, there are old script, legacy version that we are not using anymore. And so the ideal thing is that you can just revoke the approval there. So you are reducing the potential attack vector in a sense. It's not really in terms of security, but more about technical depth if you want. Also concerning that page compared to the previous one, all the scripts are loaded dynamically. So only when you click on the, the expand code, you will see the information there. It's especially meant because that page could be very long. You can have some user with hundreds or even thousands of entries that are already approved. And with that information, it's just impossible to have something like this with all the script content being loaded dynamically, uh, not dynamically, sorry, uh, statically when you request the page, otherwise the approved page will take a long time to load. So to prevent that problem, we just put some asynchronous loading of the script. And so even if you have thousands of script, normally it will not take too long. In addition to that, you have a very small thing that I really like is that little tick in green that if you are an admin configuring a job and that job contains some script, all the scripts you are writing are already approved because you are an admin. So it's 
like uh, you you don't have to approve your own script it's automatic and so that tick is just saying it was a script that was written by an admin or someone with run script and so it's automatically approved so that could be a nice difference for some of the script between something that was approved or so something that was pre-approved it could have some value for some user potentially concerning the other tab the four other tab are just separation of the things that were done in the single page before it just for the moment separate into multiple tabs without any rework on then on uh, this part it just separation between tabs that was already a good thing but their content is not changed directly and in addition to that just a nice feature also you have knowledge about the number of things that are uh, inside uh, the different tabs instead of just having to browse to the different tab you have the information directly in the title and in addition if the pending approval is empty and you are requesting the page that one you are redirected to the first tab with something inside so that could be really useful for you if you have something to approve or things like that so i think i covered most of the things i wanted to discuss if you have some questions do not hesitate please yeah, it looks really great uh, well to be honest i have never really used uh, this ui in my production instances uh, but yeah i definitely know users who do use them and for them it will be really handy especially since it's not just about pipeline it's also about other engines like job etc et so all of that can be approved to them and it looks extremely handy you now yeah I, I use this mm -hmm. interface regularly and absolutely adore what you've done Vadek. thank you very much yes sir. and people chide me that i use this interface regularly but i use it for testing in all sorts of ways and it's wonderful what you've done looking forward to seeing it perfect so just in case the pr is ready for review if you want the tests are not written for the moment not corrected because they are failing especially i don't want to write the test before we approve what is the ui we want to have so just in case you have also some screenshot with the explanation i just gave before and if you want to use on your instance ideally on a backup of your instance in case it's breaking and breaking everything it should not but just in case so you can see what is happening especially around the gathering of the metadata it could be really nice so i i could grab a build of this from ci.jenkins.io where would i go get a, a prototype build of this bad question actually due to the test failing on that build it's not possible directly so i have so, to build it myself exactly you have okay. to use my branch and with that branch you can just maven install and you have to think Right, I know how to do hub PR checkout, so I can do that. Great, thank you, Vadek. I have a question. Can I manage script approvals from my mobile phone? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Honestly, I never tried, but let's see. If you reduce the page, as you can see, the table is especially <laughs> not done for mobile. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. always the problem when you have a page with a lot of information, doing that in mobile is always a pain. And if we want to do something for mobile, we can potentially reduce the number of columns, increasing mm -hmm. the size of the row and things like that, but to be yeah. defined. Or, or in Jenkins IO, we have several tables and there we applied a magic layout, which basically converts uh, tables to rows uh, when it goes, gets narrow. I have no idea how it's implemented, but uh, it looks awesome. Uh, so, mm, yeah, anyway, it's just a niche case, I guess. But yeah, for managers, it should be really useful. Oh, yeah, probably just one point that is the most important feature that I was a bit uh, not sufficiently highlighted there. Here, you have the approved script, you can now revoke individually the script directly in the UI without using the file system. So just in case. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So I'm done with that, my demo. Yeah, one maybe question. So yeah, you improved the UI a lot. Um, are there any REST APIs or CLIs uh, behind this UI which can be used for automation? 
Nothing planned at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. The API is just the regular thing uh, from Jenkins. There is nothing specific. So if you have a token, you can call the different API uh, method. And as do you have the different hash, you can just call the API with the correct hash and it's good. So it's an interesting question because actually in the current version, everything is done with JavaScript API. I mean the JavaScript from Stapler. It's something that you cannot request using regular REST API, but now I'm using a regular REST API so you can use them directly in your script potentially. It's mm -hmm. just that you need to know the script, the, the hash of your script. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we have one presentation left. So Mark and, Vi uh, and Vlad will present uh, documentation migration and uh, the highlights we had there. Thanks, Oleg. Oh dear, where did my, I had my web browser on the screen. Seriously, I, instead I show everyone a blank screen. This one, no, just a minute, please. Sorry, there we go. Okay. Uh, no desktop demo this time. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I wanted to do was show show some of the progress that we've made, and we've had amazing progress in the last week of the Hackfest. the The results are just sort of breathtaking. Okay, here's one example: the Jenkins and Docker page has been revetted. It's thanks to to Vlad. It's been much improved in terms of current videos instead of five-year-old videos, it's a lot better layout. Well done, thank you. Um, in terms of progress on issues, we started the week with about 80 or 90 open issues and 29 of them closed. We've closed 30 plus issues here, uh, 25 plus issues here, um, just with ongoing work there. And you see a bunch of these, these issues that are all still in work now. So we're so pleased with the results. Let's show some of the examples. For example, using local language is a new page added to the using Jenkins guide. Fingerprints, aborting a build, referencing a project by name, all these pages added to the to benefit users of Jenkins as they have questions about how to use it. The remote access API, uh, great documentation here on different authentication techniques, different ways to use it, using it with Python, um, elegant, elegant work done to gather information from the wiki and put it into Jenkins.io. Now, in addition, the pipeline section got a, a, a major new addition, thanks to Devin Nussbaum for migrating the pipeline CPS method mismatches page and bringing it up to date. So this was, this was an excellent example of a place where we had good information, but that was dated on the wiki and the process of transforming from wiki to Jenkins.io meant that we would revisit that and make sure that it was correct and more complete than it had been before. So thank you very much for that transition. Likewise, in managing Jenkins, we've got a bunch of new, new capabilities like instructions on the Jenkins command line interface, how to use it, um, adaptations and corrections to it, uh, authenticating scripted clients has just been added so that we've got examples for people who wanna use curl or wget or groovy or Perl or Java to authenticate to the Jenkins REST APIs. We've got progress now is showing dramatically and continues to increase on our plugin migration. So about five or six months ago, plugin documentation began the process of transitioning to documentation as code. So the plugin documentation was right inside the plugin GitHub repositories. Well, that progress now, you see it here, over 400 plugins have completed their migration to documentation as code with another over 80 with pull requests pending their next release. So we're, we're so delighted with that progress and encourage it to continue. This is giving us a much better layout 
through the static site, plugins.jenkins.io, and making it easier to maintain plugins. We've got a project that tracks that progress. Uh, it's showing good results on automation and the work as we go through from, from each of the steps to extract the documentation out of whatever location it was, put it into the GitHub repository, all highlighted here and we can see visible progress. Likewise, our administrator guide project in, in GitHub is showing us progress and the user guide. Those were really the things that I wanted to show Oleg. Are there any questions relative to documentation? Not from me, awesome progress. So I guess we will spend the next week and maybe one week more to just review the pull requests because we still have something like 30 or 40 uh, staged. So thanks to all contributors who submitted yeah. the pull requests. Now, yep, it's our turn. Yeah, it, it, it is absolutely, uh, sorry, I hadn't turned on my video. It's absolutely amazing the number of pull requests we've received. And we are so grateful for the, those who have submitted those pull requests and glad to continue working with them to get them all the way merged so that they're helping Jenkins users. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, we have a Google season of dogs starting soon. So if somebody wants to keep working with us, so there are good opportunities to do that. Thank you, Alec. Thank you to Vlad. So, we ran out of demos. Uh, does anybody want to show any last minute at hoc ones? Uh, well, I uh, can show basically something that I had done a couple of years ago or one year ago, but I would rather discuss it first with uh, documentation officer, with Mark and with your leg before, <laughs> before jump into any demo. Just wanted to ask, well, I'm not sure if this forum is the right one for uh, the best approach to running, for instance, Jenkins IO and making this. Uh, I usually use make uh, inside my ID, something like inside visual code, but I notice there is Jenkins file inside that folder. So does it make sense to use another uh, Jenkins project and start this build process from another uh, project using this Jenkins file or using something like you authored Oleg some time ago, Jenkins file runner, I guess, something like this. Uh, like what is the best practice, best approach in creating this Jenkins IO uh, okay. uh, site? Yeah, so then demo time, right? Absolutely. Okay, so yeah, anyway, we have a few minutes, so. Uh, let's go. Um, yeah, we have this uh, Jenkins IO repository. Right. And if anyone uh, wants to contribute, we have extensive contributing guidelines uh, here, contributing KDoc. And in these guidelines, you can uh, find uh, uh, steps uh, which describe how to build and how to do common operations. Uh, and this guide is actually all around make. So there are two commands. One is make prepare, which uh, prepares your repository for building. So the uh, build process itself is dockerized and the demo is dockerized. So uh, you can use that. And uh, if you want uh, to run, uh, Jen to get Jenkins running, I have no idea what is, yeah, actually let's take a look. I guess that was maybe a bit slow in the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. Okay. Okay, doesn't really matter. Let's just run it. So yeah, this is uh, the common flow you run, uh, you use uh, when you run a demo locally because make run basically packages your site, uh, prepares everything. It's likely to be extremely slow right now because I should be running out of operating memory with Zoom. Uh, but yeah, maybe in a few minutes it will start up. So. Uh, it will basically provide you development copy. You can edit the site. For example, in my case, I use uh, mostly Visual Studio Code for development. Uh, uh, 
So why I use uh, Visual Studio Code? Because it's convenient. Before that, I was using IntelliJ IDE. Before that, I was using Atom. Before that, Notepad++. Plus Plus. So you can basically take whatever you want, uh, which supports uh, ASCII doc preview and highlighting. Yeah. So now I have even uh, less iterating memory. So we, uh, you can develop the website here, and uh, you can uh, dynamically deploy content. So for example, when you modify ASCII doc files, layouts, etc., everything will be applied automatically. It's not a case for images and for some metadata. For example, here you can see that we have some metadata. So this uh, sometimes needs a restart of the website. Uh, it mostly works, but not always. Uh, so if you talk about uh, Jenkins file, so we had some examples there, but uh, Jenkins file is rather designed for continuous integration. We had experiments with provisioning staging uh, Jenkins IO repositories. Uh, but I'm not sure whether this code is still inside. So yeah, if you develop things locally, it's better to run a make. Uh, and everything is decorated, so it uh, can run on any machine. If you use uh, Linux, uh, it's easy. If you use Mac OS, you just use Docker for Mac and everything will uh, work uh, uh, pretty well. If you use Windows, you can use Docker for Windows. And uh, like me, you can see that I'm actually uh, running on Windows. Uh, but with Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, with other magic, I think we can develop uh, the site using common make files, common endpoints, and it works pretty well. So yeah, it's not uh, that fast sometimes, uh, but yeah, it's a problem of my laptop. It's not a problem of the website. So. And yeah, once it finishes, I will just uh, get a website like Jenkins.io. So let's assume that uh, this site uh, was built locally. So we will basically get it and we'll be able to develop that. It gets provisioned on our local host 4242. Uh, so yeah, it's just in development environment, but right, right now it's not ready. Uh, well, and, and I wholeheartedly support this particular technique makes it much easier to develop, to correct, to readily see, oh, hey, how does it look when presented on the page? I can also change sizes of the web browser now very easily and say, oh, how does it look if I shrink this page? Just recently had some, some pages that had very wide examples on them and hadn't realized just how bad an impact the really wide example was on the overall layout of the page. So helped a bunch to use make run to see, oh, this page isn't as good looking as it should be. Let's fix the examples. Okay, it looks like I wouldn't be able to show it quicker. So when I don't run Zoom, it usually starts up in less than one minute, but yeah. But like today, still yeah. just everything can make and you have a lot of try to this flow. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much for sharing, uh, Oleg. I just was wondering how to use Jenkins file and you clarify this uh, perfectly that you are saying it is used for continuous integration, which is uh, yeah. like generated after we do this pull request, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So any other comments or questions before we close down? Ah, so, so Runsha asked a question on how do you test a PR? Um, I like that question because it hides a lots of things in it. Uh, Oleg, yeah. are you interested in talking to that one or do, you, do we want to, because you've got a way to test Jenkins PRs that's really elegant that I find just to be a beautiful thing. And there's, there are ways to test documentation PRs as well that I could uh, talk okay. to if that would help. Okay, so I'm not sure what is my beautiful way, uh, but yeah, by the way, I stopped sharing, I did, uh, finished the build almost immediately. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, see that. So my beautiful way of testing, uh, is, is this about the, using called the core, the core PR tester or some such oh, thing? Yeah, but it's uh, for Jenkins core, it's not for... Right, right. I was, I was not talking about Jenkins IO. I was just thinking that to test a PR, to Jenkins core, there's core PR tester. And I think it's quite yeah. powerful to okay. test a PR to Jenkins.io. I could show a demo of that. Uh, yeah, after... My question uh, was about Jenkins IO testing. So the, the oh, okay. PR is, it's perfect, but I was wondering okay. if you have something as elegant as for uh, Jenkins IO testing. 
Uh, we do actually. I can show it to you, but it, it requires installing a, a specific command. Okay. So if you want, you can do that. Uh, yeah, basically we can uh, add the same Jenkins IO PR tester. It's not a problem at all. Personally, I don't do that because it's just a few git commands to run a arbitrary repo request running. But yes, in principle, it would be an interesting topic to do. So Mark, if you want to show your flow, it's fine. Sure. In my case, I just add additional remote, I switch to the branch and then uh, get it running. So nothing fascinating at all in my approach. Right, so, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'll show you mine, which is, is doing exactly what Oleg does, but it's doing it with one command that I installed from, from a GitHub repository. So, so Oleg's, Oleg's technique is exactly the right technique. Let me share my screen and we'll show it to you. Okay, so you should see a big ugly terminal emulator window. And if I can make the text big enough to read, is that readable to everybody? Yes, it is. Okay, so first, first magic is github.com provides a command line utility called hub. Uh, hub, you install it and it gives you additional capabilities. It acts as an alias to command line git, but will also give you additional capabilities like the one I love, hub sync. Hub Sync will bring down changes from your upstream repository, merge them to your master branch, all for you automatically. So Oleg said, mentioned that there are a couple of commands you use in Git to do this. Hub Sync encapsulates several of those commands. So that was, that was now if I look at my stat, if I look at my branch list, we should see that I'm on the master branch. Now, if I wanted to evaluate a pull request, Let's say I wanted to evaluate, um, let's pick one, like maybe, uh, maybe this pull request, uh, right? Let's pick, here we go, number 3384. So if I click there, there's, this is the pull request and its number is right in the URL. It's also there on over here. So I'm gonna say hub, PR checkout 3384. Now, all that does is connect the remote, pull in the remote changes, and give me a branch locally that I can use to do my work. So I've now got the branch that matches. My next step usually is, oh, I also want to see what it looks like with master. So I merged from master, and now I just say make run. And it will now run a, oh, I've already got it running on another terminal. How embarrassing. Okay, let's go back here. Let's say make run. And now it's going to start that web server and I can, it's now running. Um, I'm, I'm not as capable as Oleg. I don't, I run on a Windows machine all the time, but I'm not um, debugging and diagnosing on my Windows machine and I'm not running Jenkins.io build. So I have to use this tunnel that will let me see localhost 4242 on my Windows computer, even though my Jenkins.io is running on a, on a website or on a, a Linux server near me. It so much it, 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 is, it is a delightful experience actually to sit in this kind of development mode because now I can, I get all the benefit of the Windows little utilities that let me change screen sizes to fit various things. It, it's, it's actually a, a fun experience to be able to develop this way. So I can now change this one back to a 1024, all sorts of little utilities like that that just make the development experience better. Runcha, did that, did that illustrate for you the how do you check out a PR and explore it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to uh, use Hub now for now on this one. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, admittedly, Hub is just is just can eye candy, right? It, it's those ex yeah. the things that Hub did. You could do with a Git remote add, a Git. Yeah, uh, but I always fetch. forget that, so then I have to. <laughs> yeah. Right, and and that's that was mine. Is oh, you know what? I know the sequence of commands, but I too often forget them. 
So I love the hub command. Hub is long term will be replaced by another command called GH, but it's not been replaced yet and it's still very much being cared for and runs great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks all. So I guess we don't have any other questions. Yeah. Thanks again to those who contributed to the Hackfest. Again, we have a final session on Monday. Uh, but it will be just a summary session. Uh, if somebody wants to demo something on Monday, let us know. So we'll organize something. And yeah, have a great weekend. Have a nice weekend. Oh, nice weekend. Yeah. Bye. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.